Good morning. Um, so we just heard Corey preach a message on how the gospel addresses um, issues of culture and race, and we thought it would be a great idea for them to share and model for us a conversation about race flowing out of their experience um, last month from the MLK 50 conference that they attended in Memphis. This conference was uh, time to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in that same city. Um, and I was able to watch on live stream some of the worship and some of the sessions and I found it to be um, very eye-opening and personally challenging and thought-provoking. It was a real good opportunity for me to um, examine my own heart and just prayerfully consider ways which, in which God's calling me to grow in this area. So we wanted to give them an opportunity to share um, some of the things that, that God did with them. Corey also in his blog this week, he highlights some of the talks that he thought were the most impactful and there's a link there so you guys can, would encourage you to read his blog and link to those talks and experience them for yourself. In his blog, Corey notes that some of the most encouraging times were the times that Joe and Andy and he shared together as they processed what was going on at the conference. And um, they want to share some of that with us this morning, including some of their own experiences with race in America and the church. So we're going to start with Joe. Um, Joe, as you were there last month at MLK worshiping and listening to the sessions and engaging in conversations with Corey and Andy, what would you say were some of the thoughts that stood out the most to you? Yep. <laughs> Thank you. So I actually think um, some of the same stirring in my heart that occurred um, at the conference is actually the same stirring that I feel in my spirit now. And I think some of that is um, being able to address the sin of racism in a space where we can actually talk about the solution and that being the gospel. And so I feel a certain um, hopelessness in talking about racism when it's sort of devoid of the actual thing that can conquer the sin. Um, and so I was amazed at the conference by just the privilege of being around lots of folks who just look different and have different backgrounds where we all sort of came together and we were talking about the sin of racism, like talking about the ugliness that that sin is, but then being able to put it in the context of um, Christ has torn down the wall that stood against us and our Heavenly Father, and if he has done that, then how much more can he tear down the walls that exist between um, all the, the differences and all the things that we experience in race. So just that theme really resonated in my heart. The second thing that really came up was just really understanding much more clearly um, just how much our God is a God of justice. And multiple times they read from uh, Jeremiah 9. I'm just going to read a portion of it. It says, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, who practices justice, and who practices righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. And so I just love the refreshment of being reminded that we actually have a God who's a God of justice, and that's a communicable attribute. So it means that if God is just, how much more than should we as God's people also demonstrate that same justice? Um, Andy, what about you? What was most on your mind during your time at MLK 50? Well, for me, it was eye-opening, like, like what you said. Um, I confess that I don't know a lot about, I know some about MLK, but not a lot about him. And so there, because of that, there, there are a lot of blind spots, a lot of um, prejudice, prejudices and, and just things that I seem to think a lot about him, which is not highly accurate at times. And so it was eye-opening in a way, on a personal level, for me to think more, uh, to know more about him. But at the same time, just some of the things that I've heard, which is pretty incredible, remarkable. You know, I often think about him as a person where I wouldn't consider um, theologically sound or accurate. But at the same time, you know, I was reminded that um, MLK didn't, didn't go to a solid reform seminary um, 
a Bible seminary because he wasn't allowed to go in, and so he has to go to uh, a seminary where it's a little more liberal, but yet, um, at the same time, God uses him to speak into the issues of race. Um, and again, um, we look at his moral failures at times, and we can you know, try to say bad things about him, but at the same time, we are open to people like David in the Bible, people like Martin Luther, who uh, could be also anti-Semitic. And, and so um, the, the point to, to this is I think it taught me a lot about just trying to look at him as a person and what God is doing in his life, at the same time knowing that God can use broken people, sinful people like him, like, like David, like Martin Luther, to uh, teach us a bit about justice, about race, about um, doing what is right in the sight of God. And as an Asian American, I think uh, generally we are a third culture in this country, and so we are generally passive. But we, are, we cling to the dominant culture when it comes to things that would benefit us. You know, we cling to the white folks a lot. Um, um, but at the same time, when we're being pressured, so we would fall back and try to assimilate ourselves with, with the minority culture, like the black culture, or... Um, the Hispanic culture. And so one of the things that it taught me too is that, you know, we're generally passive, but at the same time, you know, when it comes to an issue like race or that may not involve us, you know, we have to speak up to as a third culture because it's a sin issue, it's not a political issue. And so if we were to do nothing and sit there and be passive and do whatever things that we normally do on our own, then it is a sin. Thank you. Um, Corey, could you tell us about your experience at MLK 50? What was God doing in your mind and your heart while you were in Memphis? Yeah, so a lot. Uh, I'll distill it down uh, for the sake of time to one thought that I had. So a, a big thought that I was carrying around is, what do I do with this burden that I feel as a white person, as a pastor? Uh, what do I do with that? And so Matt Chandler on my blog, I highlight his sermon. Um, I would encourage you to, if you're going to listen to one thing, actually all of us agree, you should listen to that one first. Uh, Chandler talks about, um, he talks about the fact that really what we need to repent of, how, how do we know what to repent of or what to deal with that? And he said, you know, you don't need to repent of being a white person, you know, and like this sense of like white guilt, you know, like I, I feel guilty sometimes just being white in a conversation like that. And he said, you know what, you, you can't repent of that, nor should you, because God made you white. It's a good thing to be white. You know, God made you that way. And you don't need to repent of being born in the family or in the social circumstances that you were born into. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, into a family that did very well socioeconomically. I don't need to repent of that. That's where God put me. That's, that's, a, that's a great family to grow up in, a great place to grow up. I don't need to repent of that. But what I need to do with that is, is, is realize that I was born into a situation where I was given a lot. I, a, God gave me a lot of opportunity, and it gives me a lot of opportunity. And so what am I going to do with that opportunity? I really want to divest myself of my own resources and all that God has given me. This is Corey talking, not Matt Chandler. Okay? Uh, I want to divest myself of my own resources and all God has poured into me and pour it into people who have less opportunities than I do, particularly in the church. I liken it to this situation if you're a baseball fan. I feel like I was born in a situation where when I stand in the batter's box, I come up the bat, there's no strikes. The wind is blowing out into the outfield from home plate about 30 miles an hour. I've had great coaching, I've had great training, and now I'm told, go get a hit. I've got a really good shot at that. I've got a good shot. Other people in our country are born in a situation where they, they stand in the batter's box and the, the count is 0-2, two, two strikes. You've, had, you've not had good coaching. You've not had good training. And the wind is blowing in from the outfield to home plate at 30 miles an hour. And they say, go get a hit. Now, it's true. I have to be responsible. I have to get a hit. And they have to be responsible. They have to get a hit. But it's not the same thing. And so what I want to do is invest my life in people and raise them up and give them opportunities of all that I've been given, particularly in the church. I, I believe, this is the last thing I'll say, I believe that the future of the American church, this is a big statement, but I believe the future of the American church, the hope in that is that the dominant majority culture would invest their lives, divest of their own resources, invest their lives in minority leadership 
who will come and lead us into the future alongside us and maybe being over us, you know? That is so crucial for us to learn as a church, and I think we need to learn that uh, as a dominant culture. Thank you. This time we'll start with Andy. Um, Andy, so we're back, and you're back now in Cary, and you're a month removed from the energy and the excitement of the conference. How are you pursuing personal growth in this area of gospel and race? So, uh, as I said, you know, one of the things that helped me is in this conference is to open my mind so that I would look to my own blind spots. And one of the things that I've been trying to do more um, is to really learn to listen, um, to listen to the folks, you know, as, as you read through news each day, as you look through social media, you are bound to look at issues of people be posting segments of, of clips and things like that, and and then you look at, at the issues today with, with all the um, Black Lives Matters, um, the uh, gender neutrality um, marches and things like that. So one of the things that I've learned, even as I looked at this, is not to, is to adopt a posture of, of listening and not criticizing right away. You know, I think it's good for us to step back to be able to listen to, like, hey, why, why are you fighting for this? Why are you struggling? I mean, I'm, I know that generally some of these um, marches could be political motivated, but at the same time, you know, there are people who are really struggling, people who are really hurting in, in this, and that's why they join up to speak up. And so one of the things that I, I've been trying to do on my own personal reflection is to listen to what is going on, what is in their heart, why are they fighting, why are they hurt by this? to be able to have a conversation. I think we have lost that, that, you know, that ability to converse with people when it comes to things that we disagree upon. You know, we're quick to judge, we're quick to criticize, we're quick to elevate ourselves and find our own groups to camp around and, and speak up against other folks. And so I'm learning that, you know, I know that my wife would tell me I don't empathize very well, and so that's <laughs> something that I need to to uh, do more is to learn to listen to people, empathize with why they're struggling, and then to develop some sort of a conversation with them instead of having a, a different, more aggressive um, posture towards them. Um, next, Joe, how do you feel that you're moving forward in this area? Yes, and uh, along similar lines to what you described, Andy, um, you know, I, I'm actually reminded at the second uh, the second talk at the conference was Charlie Date, and he began by um, rehearsing some of Dr. King's um, letters from a Birmingham jail, and it's just this historical piece of literature that's amazing that it's so relevant for today. But in it, he quotes Dr. King, and there's a, a famous section there where um, Dr. King says, um, "Injustice." Um, any, uh, any, uh, anywhere is a, is a threat to justice everywhere. And what affects one directly affects um, everyone indirectly. And that piece has really resonated with me because as I've been home since that conference, like there's a part of me that feels like, wow, like there's injustice. And if there's injustice and we're all connected in the body of Christ, like the injustices that I see for someone else, like that affects me as well. And I need to sort of act on that. And so um, similar to what you've said, I do feel this renewed sense of cultivating some patience and learning how to be a good listener and learning how to um, walk in patience in light of this truth that like injustice is all around us and um, we are called to address it. Um, so that's one thing that comes to mind. Personally, I also think that I am trying to cultivate some more humility and I think some of that is just recognizing that any hope uh, for change or hope for reconciliation ultimately doesn't flow through my hands but flows through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm really desiring to be more patient and also to be more um, humble. Um, I also think that I'm really striving to talk more about justice with my children and to sort of use the opportunities that are before us when there are justice issues around us to bring the gospel to bear in that and to talk about how the gospel speaks to the injustices that we see. Um, and then I think finally I'm also like giving myself to some books and to some really good uh, pastors who are preaching some good messages. and. Uh, Ever since the conference, I've been reading uh, a book by Carl Ellis that's called Free at Last, and it's basically talking about the, um, the experience of African Americans, um, and, and sort of, it talks a lot about sort of this 
um, theology of suffering and how that theology of suffering that is so characterized um, among many African American Christians is actually embedded within a larger narrative. And that larger narrative is like redemptive history and seeing God's people as a people who have been brought out of darkness and into light. And so as I've sort of weighed on those um, words of those books and listened to some really good pastors, I feel like those are the things I've been doing to really try to uh, remind myself of what God's calling me to do. Thank you. And how about you, Corey? How do you feel that you're pursuing personal growth in the area of gospel and race? Yeah, so I majored in history at Auburn University, did really well there, and uh, made straight A's in church history and reformed theological seminary, and just completely nailed my presbytery exams in church history. But as I'm sitting there at MLK 50, I realized that I don't know really anything about black church history. And just what a statement that is, that I could go through all of that history and make straight A's in all of that and know little to nothing about the history of the black church in America. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh my goodness. (laughs) There's this whole new arena, to put it positively, there's a whole new arena of history I can learn about that I don't know anything about. And so I've started to explore uh, black history, particularly church history and read and I asked Kisa and Joe where I could start, and they said this book, Black and Reformed by Anthony Carter, is a good place to start. Anthony Carter went to RTS Orlando, had the same professors I did, and as a pastor in Atlanta, and it's a great book, both to understand Reformed theology and how it impacts uh, the black experience. So I'm really excited about learning, but I also, as I've begun to process with these guys, I just want to say that I think most of the learning that's going to happen in my life and in your life is not going to happen by reading books, as helpful as books are, or by watching YouTube videos, as nice as that is, um, I think the best way for you to learn about matters of race is through personal relationships. Honestly, Joe and Andy are my best opportunity to learn. And I coach some other guys uh, who are church planters, who are planting churches among refugees. and, And the more we can immerse ourselves in other people's experiences, the more we can learn from them. Now, What do you do with that? Now, what I would not do is to think, that's a great point. So I'm going to walk up today at the end of the service to someone I don't know of another race and be like, man, what is it like to be black? You know, first question. (laughs) What's it like to be Korean? I'd love to know. Like, not not a good way in to that relationship. What I would encourage you to do is cultivate, like, real relationships with people. Like, really share life with them. And as you build that relational infrastructure, you will have the opportunity to learn and ask questions. And that's such a great way to learn about matters of race and how the gospel applies there. So thank you very much. Um, And this obviously is not intended to be some comprehensive final conversation, but just a way to initiate with one another. And I think Corey mentions in his blog that the hope here is that we will initiate in friendship um, with others from different backgrounds than we are, um, whether it's racially or cultural. Um, And a good place to start might be in your community group or your Bible study. And then the other is that we would really have loving but honest and authentic conversations about this topic with one another um, centered in and focused on the gospel. Um, And the hope there is that it's for the good of one another and for the glory of his name. So that's, that's the idea um, as we love one another. Um, if you have questions or thoughts or concerns, I know that Joe and Andy and Corey would love to talk with you more and share more with you one-on-one about their experiences and answer your questions and thoughts. So please reach out to them. Their contact information should be on the back of your bulletin. So thanks a lot. <laughs>